In this video, Dr. Jordan Peterson explains how your unconscious mind is influencing your life. Well, here's the Freudian world. Freud, so let's, let's take a look at the history of or the idea of the unconscious to begin with. And one of the things that you might want to consider conceptually is that there are many different forms of unconscious. There's not just one. And so Alan Berger points out that by 1900, four functions of the unconscious had been described. There's a conservative function so the unconscious stores memories often unaccessible to voluntary recall well that's a strange one you know obviously you remember your past but you don't remember all of what you can remember at any given time and you don't really have access to that full store of memories although you can try to remember so the unconscious is the you can imagine the memories are represented somehow neurologically but Neuro the neurological structure isn't exactly the mind, like the neurological structure isn't exactly your consciousness. There's some relationship between them that we don't know. And the unconscious, from a conceptual perspective, is the place that your memories are that you sometimes can get access to and sometimes can't. And so you might think, well, that there are the memories that you can't get access to, there might be a variety of reasons you can't get access to them. One might be that you've just forgotten them. And one might be that they're so painful that you don't want to bring them to mind. You'll, you'll engage in tricks to stop yourself from getting access to them. And, or maybe there are memories that are so complex that, and painful that even if you did get access to them, you wouldn't exactly know what to do with them. And so there's not a lot of reason for you to bring them to mind because all it is is pain without any, without any utility. And when you understand that a little bit, you understand more about what Freud meant by repression. The thing about Freud is that he kind of believed that, like many people believe now, that when you remember a, an event in the past, it's, it's almost as if you're using a videotape recorder, and that when you experience that, the memory is somehow recorded in you like it happened. But that's not a very accurate version of how memory works. I mean, we know that memories can be easily distorted. Um, for example, if you interview someone about an event and you make suggestions that there was something present in the event that wasn't there, and then you bring them back a couple of weeks later and you ask them about the same event, they'll often incorporate the thing that they were told into the event. And so, and the idea that you can make an objective record of something that's happening to you is kind of a strange notion anyways, because, so for example, if you're having an argument with someone and later you're asked what the argument was about, and the other person is asked what the argument is about, there's no necessary reason why the accounts will jibe at all, because a lot of time when you're having an argument with someone, you're arguing about what the argument is about, right? You say, well, you're angry at me. Well, why? This is why I think you're angry at me. And you say, no, this is why I think this event has occurred. And you're thinking about, especially if we know each other well, you're thinking about the contextualization of that event across our entire history. And I'm doing the same thing. And I'm going to highlight things that you're not going to highlight. And I'm going to draw causal inferences that you're not going to draw. And for us just to get on the same page about the memory is going to be very difficult. So the idea that, in so especially with complex interactions with people, that you can somehow make a video recording of the memory and actually capture what happens is, is very, very... It's, it's not true. You, you can't. I mean, you might be able to extract out certain objective facts, but... But generally, if it's a dialogical issue, if it's a relationship issue, it spans such a long period of time that just cutting a slice of it out doesn't constitute a reasonable record of, a, of what it means. And that's what you're more concerned with, too. Like, when, when you have an experience, you're not so much concerned about what happened from an objective perspective. You're more concerned about what the experience means. And then you might ask, well, what does it mean to mean something? And that was the question I was trying to answer in that paper I had you read right at the beginning of the class. But one of the things that meaning means is that it has implication for the way you look at the world or the way you act in the world. And so if I tell you something meaningful, what that's going to mean is in the future, you're going to act slightly differently or maybe radically differently, depending on how meaning it, meaningful it is. But also that the way that you look at the world has shifted. And the way that you look at the world is actually an unconscious, it's actually an unconscious process. I mean, you don't know while you're looking at the world how it is or why it is that you're looking at the world in that way. I mean, because, well, first of all, it would just be too complicated. And second, you wouldn't be able to concentrate on what was actually going on. So your attention, 
for example, is mediated by unconscious forces. And you know that, you know that perfectly well, and this is another Freudian observation. You know, if you're sitting down to study, for example, your conscious intent is to study, but you know perfectly well that all sorts of distraction fantasies are going to enter the theater of your imagination non-stop and annoyingly, and, and there isn't really a lot you can do about that except maybe wait it out. You know, so you'll be sitting there reading and your attention will flicker away. You'll think about, oh, I don't know, maybe you want to watch Jane the Virgin on Netflix or something like that, or maybe it's time to have a peanut butter sandwich, or you should get the dust bunnies from un out from underneath the bed, or it's time to go outside and have a cigarette, or maybe it's time for a cup of coffee, or it's like all these subsystems in you that would like something aren't very happy just to sit there while you read this thing that you're actually bored by, and so they pop up and try to take control of your perceptions and your actions non-stop. Maybe you think, well, this is a stupid course anyways, why do I have to read this damn paper, and what am I doing in university, and what's the point of life? It's like, you can really, well, you can really get going if you're trying to avoid doing your homework, and, and, and then you might think, well, what is it in you that's trying to avoid? Because after all, you took the damn course and you told yourself to sit down. Why don't you listen? Well, because you're, you're a mess. That's basically why. You, you haven't got control over yourself at all. And no more than I have control over this laptop. <laughs> okay, so there's the memory function of, of, of the unconscious, and there's the dis dissolutive function, that's an interesting one. The unconscious contains habits, once voluntary, now automatized, and dissociated elements of the personality, which may lead a parasitic existence. That's an interesting one. I would relate that more to procedural memory. You know, so what you've done is practice certain habits, whatever they might be, let's call them bad habits, and you'd like those things to get under control, but you can't. So maybe when you're speaking, for example, you use like and you know, and you say um a lot, and you've practiced that, so you're really good at it, and you'd like to stop it, but you don't get to, because you've built that little machine right into your being, right? It's neurologically wired, and it's not under conscious control, and anything you practice becomes that. It becomes part of you, and, and that's another element of the unconscious, a different part. And then there's a creative part, which is that, well, you know, you're sitting around and maybe you're trying to write something, or maybe you want to uh, produce a piece of art or a piece of music, or maybe you're just laying in bed dreaming, and you have all these weird ideas, and especially in dreams. It's like, what? where do those things come from? And even more strange, one of the things that's really weird about dreams, and almost impossibly weird, is that you're an observer in the dream. It's like a dream is something that happens to you. Well, you're dreaming it, theoretically, so how is it that you can be an observer? It's almost like you're watching a video game or a movie, but you're producing it, at, at least in principle, although the psychoanalysts would say, well, no, not exactly. Your ego isn't producing it, your unconscious is producing it. It's a different thing. It's a different thing, and of course Jung would say, well, it's deeper than that. The collective unconscious might be producing it. It's in some sense, it isn't you exactly, or it isn't the you that you think of when you think of you. And that's the ego from the Freudian perspective, the you that you identify with, that's the ego. And outside of that is the unconscious, the id. That's more the place of impulses, and you could think about those as the biological subsystems that can derail your thinking, right? And that govern things like hunger and sex and aggression and your basic Instincts is another way of putting it, and it's a reasonable way of thinking about it because these are subsystems that you share with, with animals, you share them certainly with mammals, you share most of them with reptiles, you share a lot of them with amphibians, and even going all the way down to crustaceans, there's commonality, for example, in the dominance hierarchy circuits, and so these are very, very old things, and the idea that you're in control of them is, well, you're not exactly in control of them. <laughs>